At first, this story out of Savannah didn't seem like a very big deal. They're putting 10 guys on a Savannah most wanted list every week. And every week they're going to come back and tell us who's on the list, who's off the list because they were caught. Okay, not that big of a thing. But then it struck me. Savannah. Lists. All of a sudden, this tiny little story, this little tip of the iceberg was fully revealed as the big fat iceberg it was. So why don't we take a look at some, what this, what the bigger picture is behind this seemingly insignificant story. Why don't we wrap it up in a bow, a bow of denial, deceit, and delusion, and give it as a gift to the people of Savannah. Hi, this is Colin Flaherty. I'm the author of Don't Make the Black Kids Angry. Here we talk about uh, black criminality, black mob violence, black dysfunction wildly out of proportion, and how so many reporters and public officials and talking heads and lots of other people in places you might not expect it, like CPAC, are in denial, deceit, and delusion about it. That's what we document here. We call that the greatest lie of our generation, the biggest hoax of our lifetimes, the myth of black victimization and white racism. And we do it all without racism, without rancor, without apologies. So let's get started on Havana. Su Savannah. Savannah. I mean, Savannah for a long time was and is known as one of the prettiest cities in the South and the country. And, well, it got to be that way because that, you guys probably remember General Sherman's March to the Sea. Well, they just cut a big swath across the south. They just burned a whole lot of really nice stuff on the way to the sea, really just to take the fight out of the south. That's exactly what happened. So all of a sudden, you've got this big swath heading right for Savannah. It's, cut, it's towards the end of the war. The people who, who owned Savannah, they went out to the border. They met General Sherman, and they said, you don't have to burn our town. We're done. The war is over. Do not burn our town. We are not your enemies. And so Savannah escaped that enormous destruction that hurt so many uh, other places throughout the South. Let's, fly, then let's flash forward to the next time a lot of us have heard of Savannah. A, a writer, he might have been from Esquire, I forget where. National writer, National Magazine, goes down to Esquire to do a story about, goes down to Savannah to do a, do a story I, it was maybe just like a general story about Savannah and, you know, whatever they have down there, some old graveyards, some interesting people. All of a sudden, so the guy's down there, he's meeting all these people, and all of a sudden, the, guy's, the guy is like in the middle of an unfolding murder and murder investigation. So he wrote a big book about it, which I read, called Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. And it was a fantastic book. Awful movie. Sorry, Clint. God, that movie was really terrible. Great, terrific book about this guy going, hey, man, how did I get caught in the middle of this? What are all these crazy people doing around here? But it was Savannah, and, and at least in the book, you really got a, the sense that there was a lot of charm there, a lot of old world charm, a lot of people. You know, those people might have been a little neurotic, but nobody nobody was, was particularly dangerous. Didn't seem like a dangerous place. So now we flash forward up to a couple years ago. Now Savannah is a chocolate city with a chocolate mayor. They're not overly thrilled with having a lot of white people visit their town. Even so, that's what white people do down there from time to time. It's still, they still, whatever, whoever's running the town... Whatever the town is really like, the little chamber of commerce in Savannah doesn't have any problem reminding people of all the mansions and the, what do you call them, the cypress trees that kind of form a big cathedral over these roads and the old gentility, the old south, that kind of thing. So why don't we set the table for this story about the 10 most wanted by telling you my favorite story from Savannah. It started out on Mother's Day a couple years ago. A family from Atlanta went to Savannah. Now let's pick up the story from, uh, from this news report. Family attacked at a popular tourist spot. Even a six-year-old girl was punched in the stomach. 
I went to Forsyth County today where it was clear there was a fight and heard why the family wants to warn you about visiting Savannah's River Walk. Walking down River Street, just enjoying the, uh, the sights. A Mother's Day weekend in Savannah. For the Thomas and Gray families from coming, everything was fun until after dinner Saturday night. I took a punch to the eye and it cracked the outside of my orbital. I was grabbed by the back of my head at a full run and he smashed my head into the car and then I hit the ground. The brothers-in-law say their families were walking on River Street downtown Saturday night at 930 when first one man confronted them, then a mob attacked them. This was a violent, malicious attack on a family with eight people. Thomas says the attackers went after his wife. There was a man holding her by the nape of her neck with their hair and dragging her. And even his daughter. My six-year-old daughter was punched in the stomach by an adult. I don't want this to happen to any other families. They need, a, they need a stronger police presence, period. The men say they didn't see an officer for more than 20 minutes after the attack. I called the Savannah Police Department. The spokesman says downtown is heavily patrolled during the weekend, and they are investigating the attack. It's devastating. My entire family, the, the whole way back, was, Daddy, we thought you were going to die. We knew they were going to kill you. Savannah's police spokesman told me on the phone that they are going through surveillance camera video of the attack this afternoon. He says they're also looking at when that first 911 call was made to assess their response time. You did not hear wrong. Two families with a bunch of kids went to Savannah, had dinner, walking down the street, and they were assaulted by a large mob of black people. The cops didn't really give a damn about it either. Oh no, this story's just beginning. <laughs> so they go up to a they go home to Atlanta. Nobody would pay nobody would give them the time of day in Savannah. Nobody cared. They go back to Atlanta and they tell the local station we just saw here, they said, Hey, what is up with it with Savannah? How can how can people from Atlanta go down there and get treated this way? So that caused and we you saw the pic and if you see the picture attached to that audio, you'll see the fathers have beat up faces, black eyes. And it was just one big hot mess. So the mayor, finally, the mayor and the chief of police had to say something. The mayor, a black woman, she she put out a big statement. It was kind of a thing down there for a couple days, where the mayor told told everybody the truth of what happened to that family and so, that white family walking through Chocolate Savannah. They attacked the mob. The white family, two young couples couple of young kids, they're walking down the street and they attacked a mob of 20 black people. That's what happened, people. That's what the mayor said happened. Yes. Savannah. That's what happened. I still can't get over that. Nobody was ever arrested. I flashed, then we flash forward to this list. And why don't, we, uh, why don't we hear a little news story about this list that just got released uh, just the other day. Savannah police are cracking down on criminals for the first time. Police reveal the top 10 most wanted fugitives in Savannah. That list will be released every Wednesday. News News Darius Johnson was the only one to speak to police today about this new initiative. That's right, and this initiative was created by the new chief, Roy Mincer, and police say they can't catch these 10 suspects without your help. Take a good look at these photos. These are the top 10 most wanted fugitives in Savannah. It's a new initiative by the Savannah Police Department to build a relationship with the community and get these guys behind bars. Well, first of all, um, the reality is most of the people we're looking for are local. That means they grew up here or they have friends or family here. And those friends and family know more about the suspects than strangers or police. Savannah Police Captain David Gay says they want to capture all of them, but there are some at the top of their list. So anything associated with violent crime, um, is going to be obviously a priority for us. So that includes these two, Reuben McIntyre wanted for aggravated assault and Dorian Hayward wanted for armed robbery kidnapping. Nah, I've never seen none of these guys before. Kevin Henson may not recognize these suspects, but police say the more eyes that see them, the better. Yeah, they need to have something like this to get these guys off the street because just like in Atlanta, it's getting crazy out there and I'm sure it's getting crazy out here from what I'm hearing.
Now we want you to go ahead and take another look at these men. Police say if you've seen them, call 911, the tip line, or Crime Stoppers. But they are asking you for specifics such as date, time, location, clothing, and tattoos. Do not approach them. And police are hoping that this added pressure might lead more fugitives to turn themselves in. And so what you're not seeing on the list is everybody on the list is black. Every single person on that list is black. Does, it, does that sound familiar to anybody? To any of you readers of Don't Make the Black Kids Angry, does that story sound familiar? Well, it should be because we did the exact story out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. When the Chattanooga, uh, the Times Free Press, uh, well, they did the same story on their front pages. And, uh, well, why don't, you know what, why don't we just read the story out of my, uh, why don't I just read it from out of my, the chapter out of my book, Don't Make the Black Kids Angry. The chapter title is Chattanooga Story Backfires. What are 32 pictures worth? The reporters thought they were the good guys. Chattanooga is one of the most dangerous cities in America, and their series for the Times Free Press was creating pressure for local officials to do something about it. They even offered a solution that was getting some results elsewhere. Focus on high-value targets. The criminals doing the most damage. So that's what they decided to do down in Chattanooga. By December of the year 2013, seems like a long time ago now, doesn't it? The paper was bragging about the initial results of its Speak No Evil series. Police arrested 32 of the worst of the worst in this city of 176,000. And the newspaper obliged by putting their pictures on the front page. Sniff, sniff, sniff. The smell of Pulitzer was in the air. Except for one little detail. Everyone arrested, everyone in the pictures, was black. Dang. The pictures and story of the worst of the worst marked the end of the first phase of the paper's anti-crime push. Recognize that, quote, most violent crimes come from a very small pocket, unquote, of people. Then tell them to stop or move or get arrested. Two weeks later, the paper was ready for the next step. Organize a meeting to convince residents in high crime neighborhoods. Oh, geez, now they have me speaking in euphemisms to give up the code of silence and start calling police when they see a crime. But the largely black crowd of 200 that came to this meeting wanted something altogether different. To its credit, the Times Free Press, they reported that too. The forum was on video, and according to the Times Free Press, it quickly turned into a diatribe about prejudice and racism in Chattanooga. A number of comments revealed a strong belief that the black community has been treated unfairly by whites. Several speakers referred specifically to the November arrest of 32 black men that the police called the worst of the worst criminals in Chattanooga. Quote, don't just single out our kids, one black man said, speaking into the microphone. Are they the only ones that commit crime? He asked to cheers and hollers. Unquote. The focus of the forum was the so-called High Point Initiative, named after a North Carolina town where the approach reduced crime. That did not matter to a group called Concerned Citizens for Justice. Members of the group believe that white racism is behind the poverty and injustice that creates so much violent crime, and that white people often commit similar cr pr crimes, but the police ignore them. Just like our buddy John Conyers said way back at the beginning of this book. Still reading from the book here. Members of the group packed the meeting, and they were in no mood to listen to the newspaper's facts. Of the 122 shooting victims in Chattanooga from January 1 through November 21 of that year, 114 were black, 6 were white, 2 were Hispanic, according to figures provided by the police. Of the 63 known suspects, only one was white. The paper patiently reported that Kevin Muhammad, a Nation of Islam youth worker, said the white community also has a code of silence. 
He also compared the High Point Initiative to the days when police would would round up slaves. When he did, much of the crowd cheered. The Concerned Citizens for Justice posted comments live from the forum at its Facebook page. CCJ member Janelle Jackson bringing up the history of no-snitch culture and that race is a part of this conversation because we know that regardless of what has been told to us, the worst of the worst in this city are not 32 black men, unquote. The CCJ rejected the idea that the code of silence had anything to do with crime or that the disproportionate amount of black people involved in violent crime has anything to do with it either, other than the fact that black people are victims victims of relentless white racism. Quote, we find it very troubling that the war on drugs, racial sentencing and arrest disparities, the police brutality, income and uh, access inequality, racism and poverty were scarcely addressed while the bulk of investigation and blame fall on the community's code of silence. The NAACP joined in with a lukewarm statement agreeing that crime is a problem, but so is racism, poverty, and racial disparity in arrests and imprisonment. The paper recognized that fighting crime might not be as easy as finding criminals and locking them up. The hurt and anger that echoed through the auditorium suggested that Mayor Andy Burke's new violence reduction initiative faces an uphill battle among the very people it is intended to help, unquote. Then the book finishes, the chist chapter finishes up. I keep hearing about this tsunami of unreported white crime. I keep soliciting videos. I keep not getting them. It must be ninjas, said one commenter because no one ever sees them, unquote. That's a good one. So these stories are both a couple of years old. But I bring them up because I think both all, both of them could have been written today. Because this is the, the dominant narrative about uh, black crime so wildly out of proportion. It's all about white racism. It's all about cops picking on black people for no reason whatsoever. And, and that, is, that is the heart of what everybody calls criminal justice reform. Now, they just signed this bill a month ago in the White House, right? This criminal justice reform thing. We're letting lots and lots of black people out of federal prison. Because apparently the only reason they were in there was about a bunch of white racism. But it's not just a federal thing, right? This is the kind of thing they're practicing in Chicago, St. Louis, Baltimore, Chicago, Philadelphia, and hundreds and hundreds of other cities around the country. People just don't want to put black people in jail anymore when they catch them committing a crime. It's, I I don't know, maybe you could explain it. But at the under, but the underpinning of the entire enterprise, and this is one thing I was actually a little bit disappointed at, when Trump and Jared Kushner and his gang create, created this deal for criminal justice reform, underpinning the entire thing is this, is this tsunami of white racism. That's the only reason a bunch of black people are in jail, white racism. Now, different cities and states, they're bragging about who can cut their jail population the lowest. Chicago, they had a headline a few months ago. Chicago jail reaches record lows, 6,000 people. And Baltimore, the same woman who later would say, we're going to, you know, we're going to, uh, we're, we're going to protect people's right to go, you know, destroy whatever she said, or give them room to destroy. She was bragging about how in Baltimore, before she was mayor, they arrested 100,000 people a year. She cut it down to 50 a year. Now it's at 29,000 a year. Does anybody think that crime has been reduced in Baltimore by 75%? Does anybody think it's been reduced at all? They arrest 75% fewer people. And now just a few months ago, the mayor went, looked into the, the new mayor looked into the cameras and said, "Yeah, crime is is out of control in Baltimore. They don't have the slightest idea what they're going to do." to undo the anarchy that reigns on the streets of Baltimore right now. Of 
just this morning on my Twitter feed, somebody sent me a story out of the Philadelphia newspapers. It said the governor, Tom Wolf, is bragging about how few people are in Pennsylvania state prisons. Remember, he's just saying we're letting people out of prison. He's not saying these these centers of, of violent crime in Philadelphia, centers of black crime in Pennsylvania, places like Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Harrisburg, Reading, other places all around them, Chester. He's not saying crime is going down in those cities. He's just saying, well, we're kind of getting used to it more. And really, I don't want to hear any more fairy tales like Van, the one Van Jones is going to tell at CPAC. I can't... Okay, I'm not going to rag on CPAC too much, but Van Jones, you guys recognize the name Van Jones? He's the guy that used to work for Obama. He's the guy that was handpicked by Valerie Jarrett. Now he's got a show on CNN where he has a constant stream of people up there and, the constant, and, 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 and they're constantly explaining to us how black people are relentless victims of relentless white racism all the time, everywhere. That explains everything. That's his show. I mean, that's what they ought to call his show. So somehow he and Jared Kushner got in the same room. This is like a year ago, and they all decided, you know what? Why don't we get together? And Because Jared was down with this. Jared Kushner, Trump's son-in-law, was down with the idea, an idea that Trump never bought into on the campaign trail. Never. Jared Kushner bought into the idea of, of relentless black victimization, relentless white racism. And that's how they got this thing passed through the House and the Senate with Democrats and Republicans approving it. And please, let's not pretend this is anything but a sop to black people. Let's not pretend this is anything but an effort to convince black people that Trump is not the devil. Are they ever going to be his friends? No. Could he have convinced some of them the next election day at least stay home on the couch the way they did last time? Maybe, if there's no black candidate on the ballot. But he just tweeted out something yesterday. I don't know who was ragging him. Somebody was, somebody was ragging Trump about something, and he was reminding him of all the great things that he did. And he very, he very, Trump very explicitly made the connection between criminal justice reform and getting black people out of prison. And he was kind of like turning around going, okay, I did this for black people. Now, why don't you guys love me more than you do? So let's not pretend the criminal justice reform has anything to do with people of color. No, it has to do with black people and we're arresting too many of them because of white racism. And the godfather of that entire movement is at CPAC this week. You know, when you ask about, I mean, I mean, if you say, if you say we're arresting too many black people for no reason whatsoever, I mean, this thing has a lot of variations on it, right? Sometimes it's, well, you know, you arrested five black people over there, but only because there's you over police that area. There are too many cops there. If you took the same number of cops and put them over there in that white neighborhood, you would arrest the same number of people for the same kind of crimes. And here's the one example they use all the time. And it's one big fat lie. And we've talked about it here before. And not one reporter ever asks somebody when it comes up. It came up about a month ago in Baltimore. The city, the state's attorney in Baltimore, better known, we would we would probably know her as a district, the district attorney, elected official, Mosby. She announced she wasn't going to be enforcing any of the marijuana sales or possession laws anymore because it was unfair because most of the arrests in her jurisdiction were for black people. And every here's the key point. Here's the money sentence. Everybody knows black people and white people smoke the same amount of pot, use the same amount of drugs, but only black people get arrested for it. And, and we take that one micro example and we blow it up to everything else, to burglaries, homicides, rape, assault, home invasions, the whole thing. That's proof that white people are doing stuff all across the board. But you know what? Let's not leave the marijuana and the drug example. Because 
whenever you whenever you unravel this marijuana drug fairy tale about white people and black people and Asian people, we're all using the same amount of drugs. Only black people get arrested. Whenever whenever you start pulling the thread, it unravels very very quickly. So if you look, I mean, the I remember one day there was like nine stories on this. Somebody must have put a release out on it. Washington Post front page, New York Times front page. You read the story, read the story, read the story, and I think I I don't even think most of the stories explain it. They just said it. Go, yeah, well, everybody knows the white people, black people use the same amount of drugs. Colin, why do you know that? You're not too smart, Colin. So you look in the stories and go, man, where'd they get that from? Where, where, where? So there it is. I saw it. Yeah, I had to follow like a footnote to another footnote, and there it was. And the way the way this number was born from the Department of the Census. So every 10 years we do a census, right? But 3,500 uh, 3, families around the country, maybe it's a little more than that now, they're subjected to what I call the super census. So you and I fill out our form, pop it in the mail, hello, goodbye, boom. The super census is when they come to your door and they, 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 they sit down on your couch for like an hour and they ask you all kinds of questions. The questions they ask, they ask you questions about your drug use. So they look you in the eye and go, hey, so Colin, you smoking a little weed over there today, baby? How about some methamphetamine and some cocaine? I'm going, no, well, you know, not today. Well, not for the last couple hours anyway, so what of it? Anyway, so uh, they mark it down, and that's how they, and when they ask white people, when they ask black people that question, they get just about the same answer about how much, how, if you use drugs or not. They don't measure, they don't even ask about frequency. Let's put that aside for a minute. That's called self-reporting. And guess what? There's not one person in America who says self-reporting is a good idea when you are trying to figure out if somebody is actually using drugs or not. Self-reporting is good for some things to kind of give you an idea of things that can't be said in public. Maybe, sometimes. If you can't find out any other way. Like, for example, if you're doing any kind of election, have you ever done anything on an election over a phone where you're asking somebody a question? Um... If you ask, you don't really ask people if they voted in the last election. You can, but the only reason you would ask them is because you want to test their answer versus what you already know because of the sheet in front of you. So you already know. I mean, that's what these records are. They show, you know, when you when you're doing polling, you know, you know who they are, you know what their registration is, you know what their voting history is, not who they voted for, but just if they voted or not. See, so I don't even know why you would ask somebody that. Because people, when they ask, if I ask you if you voted last time, you're going to say yes, whether you did or not. Same thing happened, and we're going to get back to this drug thing in a minute. I heard a story on NPR once, not too long ago. They were actually talking about this topic of self-reporting. But it was on the topic of church attendance. Because the politicians were going around saying, you know, 40% of the people in America go to church every Sunday. That's why we got to do this or that, you know, whatever. And that's a big number, 40%. Every Sunday, 40% of the people going to church, whatever the number is. Because they went to the pastors and they said, hey, this poll says there's a lot, you know, good chunk of people in America are going to church every Sunday. Is that true? The pastor goes, no, if it were true, we'd have to be doing like, Five services every Sunday, not just one where only half the pews are full. Are full. So what they did is they did a, they called people, they actually called people up and they did one of these surveys. Hey, you go to church on Sunday? Oh, hell yeah, I go to church on Sunday. Never miss it. They followed people. And the, the number of people who actually went to church, they figured it out was you know, a fraction of everybody who said that they're what they were going to church. That's self-reporting. It's not reliable. So we get into this a lot and don't make the black kids angry. There's a couple chapters on this. So let me just try to get these chapters from memory. But uh, the, 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 the authoritative text is in my book. So they've done medical stories on this, including in Baltimore. So in Baltimore, uh, they had a bunch of people in, in for... Uh, High blood pressure test, right? So that means they were going to take blood, their sample. 
And they asked him, hey, you ever smoke pot? You've been smoking pot lately? And like most of them said, like 20% said, oh, yeah, I blew a little weed lately. Then they checked the blood. And they found out like four to five times that many or, or three, four times that many were actually smoking pot. Then that admitted it. They did the same thing for cocaine and methamphetamine, except this one was interesting because they could they actually compared the black. This is this is in the Journal of Addictive Behaviors, a peer reviewed study. They actually compared the the answers in a, in a, in a controlled environment. They had black people and white people, and they said, "So, you've been using drugs." And when you ask black people and white people that, they'll say they'll say yes or no in the same in the same frequency. But then they took the test. Then they took a blood test or a hair test. And it turns out black people lied about their drug use like four times more often than white people. And the study was very explicit. It said, listen, the biggest indicator for deception and self and self-reporting tests about drug use is whether the respondent is an African American. That's a footnote in the book, easy to find. If you ask a cop, are black kids and white kids using the same drugs, the same amount in frequency and in amount, the cop will say, oh, hell no. More black kids smoke pot, more black kids use drugs from an earlier age, and they use them more often. Ask a cop. Look at the literature. Look at the literature where you test somebody. What kind of fool would look at drug user, a drug potential drug user in the eye and go, sorry, you know, are you using drugs? Of course they're going to say no. Nobody admits to being a drug addict or a potential drug addict. But yet now we're going to have a room full of people down at CPAC that are just going to be looking. I was at, I went to CPAC last year. I just walked around to see what it was. And, you know, it seemed like a nice crowd, a young crowd. It's going to have a room full. I just picture a room full of these doe-eyed 25-year-old guys and gals looking up at Van Jones. He's sitting there explaining to him this unbelievable injustice. So many black people in prison for no reason whatsoever. And everybody knows you white kids are out there smoking pot too, right? And all the kids are going to go, <laughs> they're going to giggle. Oh, yeah, I went to college. I know all about how all white people smoke dope, Van. Oh, that's 100% true. So Van Jones is going to get a free pass at CPAC. No one's going to question him. Hey, if you're if you listening to this podcast and you know somebody going to CPAC, challenge them. Challenge them to challenge Van Jones on his fairy tales. We are letting an entire generation of criminals out of jail. Dangerous criminals. I mean, do I, I don't, I mean, I almost feel embarrassed when I say this stuff sometimes. So you know that when somebody gets arrested for conking somebody over the head or they get arrested for a burglary or some other violent crime and they have some drugs on them, Sometimes the victim will disappear. You know how that works. I mean, I did a story about this involving one of my buddies, Ralph. This happened to Ralph. Ralph lives a block away from here. So Ralph, a couple of the fellas tried to rough Ralph up, take his stuff. Ralph gave as good as he got. The fellas ran away. The fellas, they would have gotten away, except they ran right through a police, like, they were doing a stakeout on somebody else. All of a sudden, these two fellas come sprinting through, and all of a sudden, over the radio, it goes, I'll be on the lookout for these two fellas dressed like they're playing tennis at a country club. And uh, yeah, they just did a robbery over here. So boom, they caught them, just by luck. Turned out like six or seven of those people, turned out like they had robbed six or seven people who reported it. Do you know like 50% of the people don't report violent crimes? They report violent crime, don't report them for a couple reasons. The biggest reason is, one, they don't think cops will catch them. Two, they don't think if they catch them, they'll do anything to them. And three, they think they're putting themselves at risk if they report a violent crime, stitches for snitches. Most violent crimes are not reported, over 50%. And so... And so anyway, so they catch the guy 
and they're going to court. Like two a couple months later, I think, I think in the meantime they're out on bail. Ralph shows up. They're going to have a trial, so they have all the witnesses are there. Like Ralph and five other people, like six people are there, ready to testify. The attorney stand. The defense attorney stands up. He goes, "Oh, Your Honor, we'd like a continuance. We're not. We haven't had ready to we haven't time to get ready yet." The judge goes, "Oh hell yeah, go ahead, boom." Come back six weeks later, two months later. Oh, Your Honor. Except now there's only five people there. Five witnesses. One of them dropped out. Your Honor, we'd like a continuance. We need a little more time to prepare our case. Boom. Next month, four are there. It keeps going. Three, two. Finally, Ralph is the only guy there. He's in the, he's in the courtroom sitting behind the district, uh, the district attorney. And he's talking to the DA. And the DA said, I think he's going to ask for another continuance. So Ralph says in a stage whisper so everybody in the court could hear him, especially the defense attorney. Ralph said, I don't care how long this takes. I don't care if it takes until doomsday. I'm going to come back every single time until these guys are put on trial for what they did to me and my neighbors. All of a sudden, five minutes later, the judge goes, Oh, Your Honor, uh, I think we'd like a few minutes to confer with the district attorney. All of a sudden, there's a deal. The guys get like two or three years. Ralph got a uh, notice in the mail about a year ago. Hey, they're coming. They're getting out of jail. Hope you're okay with that. And, 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 and so Van Jones is trying to pretend like none of this exists. Like, Everybody that's being, the cops are picking on black people for smoking pot when actually they've got them for some violent crime and the people disappear so they can get them on the pot so they they arrest them for the pot and they make that stick. That's why people, you know, it's hard to go to jail. It's hard to go to prison. They didn't want to send these kids to prison. It's hard. You got your court psychologist going, oh no, man. Those kids are just misunderstood. We'll give them some free basket, midnight basketball. All will be good. I'm not kidding. People still say that stuff. Judges still buy it. That's why when you're, that's why when the, the, the fellas in Wilmington and all over the place, when they're shooting each other, the people who are shot have a, have a criminal record usually as long as the people doing the shooting. I mean, everybody with these long, violent criminal records, they're just out on the street again. And now Van Jones is going to try to convince us that this is all some racial racial conspiracy to keep black people behind bars. And the people at CPAC invited him there to repeat this fairy tale. Okay, he's going to have a lot of cover. Trump's going to get up there and say the same thing. I like Trump, but I'm not giving him a free pass on this. Nobody gets a free pass. Look, here's what happens. If you've never worked for politicians, you probably have you probably overestimate their godlike qualities. Okay, I've worked around a lot. I've worked for a lot of them. Never a president, but I've worked for a lot of others. <laughs> they're actually a little crazy. They're a lot crazier than your average person. And so I don't give them a pass. I don't put them on a pedestal. If Trump does what he says on my issue, I- I'm just going to tell you what he does on this issue of black violence and denial. If he's good on it, I'll tell you. If he's not, I'll tell you that too. His record is actually mixed. Bad on criminal justice reform, good in other areas. But I just can't get over CPAC inviting Van Jones. As if, you know, when they made this deal, we have to ask, did they come to the middle and negotiate? Or did Kushner just walk into the room and say, listen, uh, I need some I need I need something to throw to the reporters to say that we really like black people and black people really like us. So why don't we just do criminal justice reform and we'll give you whatever you want? How's that sound? That's the way that deal went down. Criminal justice reform. Colin. White people and black people commit the same amount of crimes. White people get away with them. Cops ignore white people committing crimes. Okay, if that's true, where are the videos? Where are the victims? Where are the 911 calls? Where are the police reports? There's no victims going on YouTube going, Hey man, this white guy just came into my house, held a gun on me, stole all my crap, tied me up, and beat the hell out of me. I called the cops. They came over. 
The first thing they said was, was that criminal white or black? When I told them it was a white guy, they said, they started laughing and they said, man, that dude gets a free pass. What's wrong with you? Why'd you even call us? That's the world we're living in, right? That's the world of Van Jones. I don't blame Van Jones for being bold and foolish enough to try to pull one over on CPAC. But now CPAC is just standing there and like that little beggar boy I have in my videos and all they could do when Van Jones heaps this pile of nonsense on them, all they could do is hold their bowl up and go, please sir, I want some more. Good Lord. All right, why don't we take a little, do a little break for Colin's little commercial message here. Hey, we were talking about over the last few podcasts and on my videos and in my mail. Oh, by the way, if, you don't, if you're not on my email list, get over there and get on it. Just go to colinflaherty.com. You'll see a little box. Put you know first name, le- uh, email. Get on it. Man, I see all these stories. Everybody's being deplatformed. Laura Loomer, Tommy Robinson, off of Facebook, off of PayPal, off of here, off off there, you know, I mean, you guys know, you followed all the places I've lost my platform. How many times do we lose our YouTube channel? The only way we can bulletproof that is to, you have to be on my email list. And if you're on my email list, go to your like uh, email client, whatever you call them, the server, your email app. Go up there and make sure Colin at ColinFlaherty.com gets through your spam filter, Okay. So get on my email list. That makes us bulletproof. Right now, if you're not on my email list, we're just sitting here at the whims of some 23-year-old recent college graduate with purple hair sitting in a cubicle drinking Diet Coke by, you know, 60 out of a 64-ounce cup in Silicon Valley. That's who is deciding what we get to see and not see, hear and not hear. That's why you got to stick with me on email. Anyway, so we've been talking about this uh, send a book to a reporter for for Black History Month. And man, thank you guys. A lot of you guys responded to that. I was hoping we would do two things. One, educate a lot of people that would get that book. And by the way, some you know, there's two ways to educate. One is the ideal would be you'd send them a book and they'd read it and they'd open their eyes and go, oh my God. But the second thing we'd educate people about is, wow, that person so interested in that issue that he'll send me the book. That is a very important statement to make. But I also, I was also hoping on a third level, I was also hoping that this book would shoot up the Amazon sales chart up to compete with the other books on the uh, African American bestseller list. My book spent a lot of time on that list, but after it's been out for a while, the sales taper off a little bit. I was hoping to jack it back up there, however, temporarily, so we could go around going, hey, look what's uh, you know the best-selling African-American book, book on African-American studies in America during Black History Month. Don't make the black kids angry. Bam. So if you're up for that, go do it, and we can have a lot of fun with it, and maybe we'll do some good as well. And while you're over there, Putting my name, putting your name on my email list, Colin over at ColinFlaherty.com. Um, you know, let me back up. There's a couple things. I mean, so we kind of, kind of, I kind of got in the middle of what we, you know, if you want to do, want to be a part of this, what you could do. The simple things are share, like, subscribe, and comment to these videos. Those, that's really important to this podcast, to these videos, to my Twitter, to my Facebook. Even though I'm not on there anymore, I still have a lot of stuff posted. Go over there and do all those things. Ditto for Twitter. Ditto for Minds. Go over to Minds.com slash Colin Flaherty. I'm posting videos there all the time. Just share, like, subscribe, comment. And if you see something happening in your neighborhood, let me know. And if you really, if the spirit's really moving you, drop a few coins in my cup at PayPal. You'll see the PayPal thing over at colinflaherty.com. Uh, what what it'll take you to is uh, paypal.me slash flaherty457. Put a few coins in the cup. Be the wind beneath my wings. We are in this together.
And if you and if you really feel in spirit after you do all those things, and you're listening to a Sean Hannity or a Michael Savage or a Rush or your local guy, or you're listening to one of the watching one of the TVs, pick up the phone and call them. Go, hey, I saw the story about a hoax. Colin's been on that for a while. It's a, and just give them whatever we're talking about. Give it to them. Tell people. Tell people what we're talking about. Remind people of the greatest lie of our generation. Remind people how many hoaxes we've done here, we've uncovered here, over and over and over, and how long we've been doing it, and how the reporters are so eager to report this piece of fiction. How many people are eager to to, to say it? How many people are eager to believe it? That's all important. That's what you can do for starters. And at the end of it, when we ask what, when you ask yourself, what can I do? The answer is, I do what I can. That's your answer. Do what you can. And whatever it is, it's good enough. Okay? Let's get back to the normally scheduled portion of this podcast. Sometimes I think... Uh, the people who watch this channel and give me such great encouragement and other people, we don't give ourselves enough credit. We say, well, Colin, you know, it's not on CNN, so nobody's talking about this. Well, there are lots of people talking about it, but somehow we overlook them, we marginalize them, we we pretend they're not there, and all we do is hurt ourselves by saying that. And it's not even true. I think another group called Campus Reform. Boy, those guys are so good at seeing, at letting us know what's happening on these college campuses and lots and lots of their stories involve these, the greatest lie of our lifetime, the hoax of black victimization, which is really kind of a, a religion on these campuses. Well, it's half religion. It's called critical race theory, right? But really, it's not a theory anymore, but because for some people, it's an industry and for other people, it's a religion, And I think there was a case a couple weeks ago where a professor was saying how much white people suck. Very explicit. I think it was in Baltimore. Now we got another one of these from the University of California, Davis. By the way, UC Davis, that town is about as white as white gets, okay? That's a college town. Has like more bikes in it than any other town in, in the country. You know, it's weird though. About a year ago, they did have some kind of, they were having some kind of parade there and a bunch of black people showed up and they caused some big riot even though there aren't that many black people in Davis. Except for this professor. Uh, I first heard about the UC Davis professor who thinks cops should be killed late in the fall quarter. There were murmurings and about this in his class discussions. There were rumors that he advocated for violence against law enforcement. But it bothered me, said this writer whose name is Nick Irvin. Bother, I think he's a student there. It bothered me that I heard was, I thought it was typical hearsay and exaggerated. I wasn't shown anything concrete. So I kept the rumor in the back of my mind. The killing of Natalie Corona changed everything. Corona, an up-and-coming Davis police officer, was gunned down last month, was the type of person who makes labeling all law enforcement as bad a simple exercise in fallacy. She was a very nice person, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they go, they go on to say about what a nice person she was and how she really destroyed this narrative of cops being bad people. And then we get to, uh, then we get to this guy named Joshua Clover. I am thankful that every living cop will one day be dead, some by their own hand, some by others, too many of old age. There's another tweet. I mean, it's a lot easier to shoot cops when their backs are turned, right? Another one. People think cops need to be be reformed. They need to be killed. So here's the drill on this Professor Clover at the University of California, Davis. He is white. But Professor Davis, uh, he does a lot of writing about white racism and black victimization. He, He writes books about uprisings like Ferguson. He, he, he mem- he's a member of these national committees that talk about racial capitalism. So this guy is de- 
So this guy is down with the cause, down with the cause of black victimization and white racism. And so when he talks about killing cops, there's no doubt what he's talking about is killing cops for everything they do to occupy the black neighborhoods and mess with black people so much. Thanks for thanks to Campus Reform for exposing this clown. For all, I don't know what kind of good it will do other than to let people like you and me and I, me, know how bad it is on these college campuses and how we really need to burn down the mission there, to quote John and Elton John's song. Wow, there's so, so, so much stuff coming into my email box. So much stuff going on out there. So little time. Really happy you've been here with me during this podcast. Thanks to everybody who's telling their friends about it, who's sharing it, who's liking it. I mean, I, I, we were, we, when we, we were doing this a year ago, we had a pretty good audience. Then I got a little bit sick, so I had to knock it off for about a year. Now we're kind of almost back to where we were. And we're getting some really good reaction on it. So as long as you guys keep liking it, keep supporting it, we'll keep doing it as often as I can, at least Monday through Friday. And I try to release them at like 7 a.m. Thanks for being here with me. And remember, whatever the hell else you're doing out there, don't make the black kids angry. Talk to you next time.